The, the point is we test our inferences about the past against our knowledge of the cause and effect structure of the world. We know from experience that intelligence produces information. When we find information on the Rosetta Stone, we therefore infer that an, uh, uh, there was an intelligent cause at work. That's, that, is, that is testable against the backdrop of our knowledge of cause and effect experience. I see Joe Felsenstein in the audience, probably one of the world's greatest evolutionists, and I see him, well, I should see his expressions. Uh, I, I would love that if Joe could come up here, I guess he can't, and talk to us about your comment about intelligence and this digital code business. From my own point of view, you're going on. Joe! No, no, that's okay. The next one. It, it, it seems to me that digital code is one of the things that I study. I study the appearance and the disappearance of things. So when I look at the fossil record, it really is a digital yes, no. It's around for a while, then it goes extinct. And so I'm looking at terminations, presence, absence, presence, absence. That's a whole digital code. It's got nothing to do with intelligence. And yet here is this beautiful pattern. Where it is coming from is extinction or not of extinction based on adaptations of organisms. AID has nothing to do with this. Well, you, this is simply natural selection and extinction, and sometimes meteors from space. And unless your designer is throwing the damn meteors, then how do you account for this? I, I'm talking about the digital code in DNA. You're confusing that with a, no, a digital a, a, code, an analytical pattern. You are saying you there's might, no biological uh, pattern of digital code that is not produced by an intelligence. I just gave you one. That, 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 that's not functional information. That's your well, description. Well, it's real information. That's your description of, of the pattern in the fossil record. And we have, you, you, what's wrong with my description? Are, I think it's, I'm sure it's accurate, Peter. That's not the problem. <laughs> we have okay. 10 minutes left. We're, we're talking we talk about, about software we teach the stuff that functions like yes, software. Let's talk about teaching yeah. the controversy, Peter. Thank Good. you. Okay. Um, uh, and what, Peter, we'll, let me start with you. Uh, uh, is there a controversy over Dar Darwinian evolution? Um, there are so many controversies within evolutionary biology. I mean, where do I start? We have, everywhere we look are controversies, but there are controversies in every science. There are thousands of controversies in physics or in chemistry or in any field of biology. Why do we single out evolutionary biology? The fact that we have controversies, just like Cobb County, Georgia, we put a little sticker on it, let's single out evolution. The fact that we have controversies somehow makes us less legitimate as a science. That's what science is. It is nothing but controversies. Why do we single out? So I, I have a nine-year-old. Patrick Ward, are you here? Patrick, or did you go home? There he is. Check that out. He's wore a tie for the first time ever today for this. Okay, my son Patrick Ward is in a Seattle public school. He has science. When you're teaching nine-year-olds, you don't really, you can't teach science. Science is a verb. It is not a noun. I think that's really important. Science is a verb. And all we have time to teach in middle school are facts that science has come up with. But we can't teach how to do science in a middle school or a grade school. Now, they want to teach the controversy. How in the world, when you can't even teach real science in a grade school, are you gonna have a nine-year-old like Patrick Ward try to balance a political point of view with a very complex methodological construct, one of the greatest the human mind has ever come up with, which is this verb we call science. It can't be done. If we teach the controversy, we remove the amount of time that Patrick Ward gets to hear about really important things, like biology, like DNA, like astronomy, and we put it in the realm of politics. We change a science class to a politics class. Now let's say that every public school in America, as these folks want, teaches intelligent design, politics, next to science. What are American students like? How do they compete with the Chinese? How do they compete with the Europeans and the Japanese who don't do this? What do we do if we tell students the answer to that question is way too complex, forget about it, we kill curiosity? This will be my only heat of this point. Intelligent design taught in our schools will kill curiosity. And we become a nation of second raters. Okay. Think about this. Steve, can you, th there's been controversy even about what does it mean to teach can, controversy. What does it mean when, when Discovery Institute says that? Um, 
I don't think teaching, uh, first of all, one thing Peter and I agree about is that, I, that uh, science is full of controversies. And our proposal for science education, which I've made um, with my uh, Darwinist colleague, fa former UW professor John Angus Campbell, is that teaching arguments and competing Darwinist. Ar uh, teaching arguments in science is a very good way to teach science because one of the things that scientists do, one of the most important things that scientists do, is they argue about competing interpretations of the same evidence. And uh, in, in Darwin's book, um, in The Origin of Species, Darwin says that he's making one long argument. And contemporary neo-Darwinism, which is indeed a biological perspective, uh, makes uh, many of the same arguments, but they're updated. And it turns out if you survey the biological literature, whether you're talking about the evidence from the fossil record, the evidence of molecular or anatomical homology, the evidence from biogeography, the evidence for the uh, causal efficacy of natural selection acting on random mutation, there are evidence-based counter-arguments to most of the main arguments that, that are made in the, in the neo-Darwinian synthesis. So what we, we think, that this, is, this doesn't kill curiosity, this it opens the door to but curiosity. But it does, it says it's so complex. No. no. And, and another, another thing that, that, that uh, I mean, you, you have, we're, we're, by the way, we're not advocating that the theory of intelligent design be required in the public schools. We're trying to develop a scientific research program. We funded a lot of research. Most of the, the key books that have been produced in the early phases of work on intelligent design were funded by our institute. Uh, our, our proposal is that students should learn the scientific case for Darwinian evolution in its modern and full glory, but they should also learn the, the scientific arguments against the theory as they appear in the scientific literature. The Cambrian explosion is a serious challenge to the idea of a seamless development of life. Oh, not even you have 40 body plans that emerge suddenly in the fossil record. And we can if, do if that, that so the, simply with Hox genes. I teach this one of the lectures That's in my very class. controversial, it's, whether no, Hox genes. That's, that's exactly no, the, the, the perfect listen. illustration of what we're saying. Three weeks from now, I'll give that lecture. Please come. I will convert you. It'll be... I, I Turn know about to the Darwin people. side. <laughs> My first uh, convert. He's inviting me to join the dark side again. Oh, like, uh, yeah, it's the light yeah. side. Look at this suit, let's, man. Uh, yeah. Let's let uh, the audience ask some questions sure. uh, uh, through me in this case. They, we got, I have three piles, uh, uh, one that are for both of you and then some for, for one or the other. But let's start with some that are for both of you. Um, going for some more common ground. Is there any place where these two ideas intersect? Is there any possibility of both, both of these theories being partly true? Peter? Well, no, there's only one theory, and there's one political ideology, so they can't intersect. Now, on the other hand, Steve has done some very good work, and I've actually seen what he has done. He actually has done real science. He worked for a scientific company. He's helped us find petroleum. He's helped in the good old days when gas wasn't three dollars per gallon. Actually, that was the only time I was employed, was it? it was just as high. You know? <laughs> so he has done science. But the ID side isn't science. It can't intersect. There's no intersection. If one part goes for something supernatural, all of a sudden you're out of the realm of science. I mean, how would you like, how would you like it if we went to a religion class and I started teaching organic chemistry? Steve, go ahead, answer um, the question. Do you see a place where, where these could intersect and they both could Yeah, be of course. Um, you know, we, I said at the beginning that we don't challenge the idea of change over time. Uh, Peter and I have substantially the same view of the fossil record. Uh, what we, uh, we challenge is the idea that there's a purely undirected process driving all that change. So uh, I, here, I had a, something 